All right, well, if you'll open to Mark 14, There's something really cool I'll fill you in on as we, as we start. Um, I was kind of looking at all the passages uh, remaining in Mark and looking at the calendar. We're going to end with the resurrection on Easter. And so that, uh, that's just really cool how it lines up so perfectly. And so it's coming, it's coming. Um, but uh, not so fast, right? This morning uh, we're in quite uh, a dark point in this story. As I said to the kids, this is uh, Peter's denial of Jesus. But let me just begin by asking you all a question, okay? You don't have to answer out loud. I guess you can if you want to. But um, what is your greatest fear? Or maybe just what are some of the things that you're afraid of? I mean, people are afraid of all kinds of things, right? And we can think of maybe some more trivial things like spiders. Well, some of you might not think that's trivial at all, <laughs> right? But, you know, we can say spiders or loneliness, right? Those are different kinds of fears. But some people are really afraid of spiders. Uh, some people are really afraid of being lonely. Some people are really afraid of failure. Some people are afraid of heights. Um, anybody afraid of heights? Yeah, we got, we got a few. Um, public speaking, right? Uh, I've, I've seen some statistics, and some people are more afraid of public speaking than death. Um, and so uh, there's, there's all kinds of uh, different fears out there, and they're all very real fears. But I would suggest to you that for the vast majority of people, their greatest fear is none of these, uh, but rather it is the fear of man. The fear of man. And, and by that... I don't mean like the fear of, of being mugged on the street or something like that, although we might include f- physical affliction in the fear of man. Um, but just more generally speaking, it's caring too much about what other people think or how they might respond to you if, if you displease them, right? And so maybe the flip side of, of fearing man is being a people pleaser, right? I just, I just, I just want to make everybody happy. I don't want to offend anybody. And, uh, and some people... Their lives are controlled by this. And I think for all of us, like we can all um, uh, fall prey to that and and, and, in some way or another be controlled by the fear of man. Jesus says very boldly in Matthew 10, 28, Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Do not fear man, but fear God. And, and, and what he's really getting at here is like, okay, uh, man has no power over you compared to the power that God has. Now let's put in some negative terms, right? But um, more positively put in, in Psalm 18.6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Right? So if you know that you belong to Jesus, well, you don't have to fear hell. But you still don't have to fear man because the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or similarly, Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? That right there is what we all must have if we're to make any true difference in the world. Right? Have you ever seen someone where you like, no, okay, yeah, that person, they don't fear man. That person is going to stand up for what's right. That person is going to speak the truth no matter what the consequence. Right? That's, that's um, inspiring. That's what changes things, right? And so, we, of course, we all ought to have that desire to, to, not, to not cower in fear of man, but to do, to say what is right. But we all so easily can, at times, succumb to the fear of man. In fact, in Peter, we really see prime examples of both. So, for example, in Acts, so we were, you know, we're uh, in uh, Acts in our in in the uh, young adult Sunday school class right now. Young adult is kind of loose, a loose term, (laughs) but uh, uh, but we're we're going we're going through Acts, and and we see Peter with such boldness, standing before councils and, and, and proclaiming, hey, you crucified this man by the hands of lawless men, and unless you repent, there is no other way that you can be saved. No other name. And so, and so Peter has this boldness we see as we get into the book of Acts. 
We see he's emboldened by the resurrection of Jesus. And he passionately proclaims the gospel through persecution and and imprisonment and, and all the way to his death. But that comes only after what we see here, right on the cusp of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, We see here an all-time low for Peter, and that is his denial. Um, In fact, Jesus foretold that this would happen. If you look in verse 30 of Mark 14, in verse 30, Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And so that's what we're going to see in real time this morning. Peter denies Jesus three times. It's, It's a very sad scene. But just as we learn some lessons from Judas, we here learn some lessons from Peter. But praise God, one of those lessons is that you can get back up after falling, right? Judas didn't get back up. It was was the end of Judas, uh, that is his betrayal of Jesus, right? Whenever he uh, led uh, led the uh, uh, authorities to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Peter, he does get back up. So that's certainly one lesson, but, but really our, our points this morning are just going to, going to correspond with um, Peter's three denials. And so we see three stages to denying Christ. The first one is claiming ignorance. That's essentially what he does is he claims ignorance. The second is disassociation. And the third is outright denial. And so as we see the ways in which Peter denies Jesus, there are some lessons for us. And so with that said... Uh, We'll read our passage. We're in Mark 14, verses 66 through 72 this morning. So if you'd stand with me in honor of reading God's word, uh, we'll begin in verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, now let me pause. Remember, this is, you know, Jesus has been uh, taken uh, to the courtyard of the temple. He's he's being tried now, uh, kind of an ad hoc trial. Um, and as Peter was below in the courtyard, verse 66, one of the, servants girl, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's pray. God, as, as uh, sad as this scene is, we thank you for preserving it in your word for us so that we can learn the lessons that you want us to learn. And so I pray, Lord, that as we make our way through these three denials, that you'll help us not just to examine Peter, but to look at our own hearts, look at our own lives. Help us to examine ourselves rightly. But I pray also, Lord, that you'd fill us with hope because we see that in the story of Peter, that even after this hard fall, that um, he was restored and that he was emboldened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so help us uh, to, to have that as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's, no, no, it's noteworthy as we look at this account that the main questioner Right? The, 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 the person who's at the forefront here, who is asking Peter again and again about, hey, do you know this man? Aren't you one of, aren't you one of them? Um, this main questioner is not a powerful politician or not even some kind of physically intimidating person, but it's a servant girl. Do you notice that? It's a servant girl. Now, perhaps Peter was afraid of what would follow from that. And we can only use our imagination as to what he might have been thinking. But this still serves to illustrate that it doesn't take much to invoke the fear of man. Not even this little servant girl. And so that's something I want us to be thinking about as we go through this, right? As, as we think about the ways we might struggle with the fear of man. Um, sometimes 
when you, when you look at it maybe uh, objectively, it's so silly, so silly, the, the, the things that we can get um, so concerned about. But, but Peter, uh, Peter is, is really in a, a, quite a pathetic place, it seems here, right? This, this servant girl is questioning him, and three times he denies Jesus. And so let's just look at these one by one. The first, the first way that he does this is essentially by claiming ignorance. Okay, So verse 66 says, Peter was below in the courtyard. One of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. He says, I don't understand. I don't know what you mean. Now, she asks a pretty straightforward question, right? She says, you were with the Nazarene Jesus. Really, she puts it in the form of a statement. You were with the Nazarene Jesus. And yet Peter says that he doesn't understand It's kind of like a a politician, or sometimes pastors can do this as well. Sometimes we all can do this, right? Maybe maybe you dodge a question that might be damaging, um, and and you claim ignorance. We see it all the time, especially like in the political sphere, right? you you got to know how to to dodge a question. And that's essentially what Peter is doing here. And uh, and again, especially considering the circumstances, it's, it's quite... Pathetic, right? This little servant girl is, is simply saying, you are with the Nazarene Jesus. And again, what does he say? He says, I neither know nor understand. What do you mean? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't understand. What do, you mean? what do you mean by that? Peter says. He claims ignorance. Now that alone is concerning. Uh, it exposes a real weakness. And then when it comes to our Christian faith, uh, well, this can lead toward a devastating spiral to outright denial okay now to be sure this is a form of denial itself Um, remember Jesus has said before the rooster crows twice you will deny me three times and then what does it say in verse 68 says he denied it and then we have that first crowing of the rooster so this this is a denial of Jesus but it's but it's very subtle Right. Uh, this this uh, is, is maybe a more subtle way that leads to a more outright denial, which we'll see uh, particularly in the third denial. But it begins it begins small. It, it, it begins with just uh, a seemingly innocent claiming of ignorance. It's a subtle denial. And of course, as, as we are reading this, as we're thinking about Peter's situation, we also ought to be thinking about uh how this might apply to us, and, and I, I wonder, how might we sometimes be guilty of subtle denials of Jesus? You know, it can be easy to avoid controversy by claiming ignorance, right? So maybe s- someone in the workplace, or even maybe a, a friend or a family member, or just, uh, you know, fill in the blank, but, but some, someone comes to you and says, Hey, do you really believe such and such? Does the Bible really teach such and such? You know, more and more as, 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 as time goes on, um, a lot of things that we believe as Christians are, are not very culturally acceptable. And it can be very, very easy to maybe water those things down or, as we see here with, with Peter, to, to claim ignorance. Now, again, Peter's situation is different, but... Um, it's, it's quite unique, right? And so, so how might we be guilty of the same kind of thing? Peter claims ignorance, in this case, just uh, of, of being associated with Jesus, of, of, of being, um, uh, like, what's, what's the way that she puts it? You were with the Nazarene Jesus. So Peter claims ignorance, and sometimes I wonder if uh, we can be guilty of that, right? That might be a subtle way that one can be guilty of denying Jesus. To play dumb, to say, well, you know, well, I'm, not, I'm really not sure. I don't know. Um, when, uh, when, when maybe it's uh, a situation in which we, we ought to take a stand, right? Now, of course, there, there's always things that we don't know, and, and there's, and there's um, 
maybe situations in which we can um, say, oh, okay, I need, I need to look for the answer on that. But uh, this is kind of this is a heart question, I think, right? Are, are there times in which you might claim ignorance as a, as a subtle form of denial? 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Now, ladies, I don't know what to say to you for this verse. He says, act like men. But I think you get the point, right? Uh, the, the, it's, it's telling us that we need to stand firm and uh, we, 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 can't, we can't cower, and kind of like we see Peter doing here, um, when, when the pressure comes. Okay? And so, so claiming ignorance, that's certainly what we see him do here. And, and I think in our own ways that uh, we can be guilty of it if, if we're not careful. And so that's kind of the, the, maybe the first stage of denial. It's a, it's a subtle stage of denial. But that's what Peter does first. And then the rooster crows. And so that first rooster crow uh, served as a warning, we might say, um, but it was not heeded. Right, we, we, as we continue on, we see again and again Peter denies Jesus. And so the first, the first way he does it is by claiming ignorance. Right? He says, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I neither know nor understand what you mean. The second is disassociation, which... We even see an element of that in the first, right? Because the, the question is, or, or the statement is, you were with the Nazarene Jesus. He says, I don't know what you're talking about. But next we see, I think, a more clear disassociation. And so uh, look at verse 69. And the servant girl saw him again and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. This man is one of them. So Peter denies to be one of them. That is one of Jesus' followers, one of those who was with Jesus. And so we see here that the second form of denial is um, a, a kind of disassociation. I'm not one of them, Peter says. Now clearly Peter is trying to protect himself. And again, we don't know exactly what all of his concerns were. Maybe he was in fear of um, that he would face a similar physical fate that Jesus was to face, um, uh, or, or who knows? You know, may, maybe he just um, was, was was caving in to the uh, to the pressures. Right, Jesus Jesus wasn't very a popular person at this point in time, uh, as he was standing trial. So. Peter's trying to protect himself. But you know, a lot of people um, will maybe say the same kind of thing that Peter said. Oh, I'm not one of them. But maybe even say it with a sense of pride. Um, for example, when the world accuses Christians of this or that, whether rightly or wrongly, people might reply, oh, I'm, I'm not one of them. And so here we have a denial by, by disassociation. It's not so much an outright denial, right? Like, like, like Peter here, he's not yet outright denying knowing Jesus or anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting there, right? But right now he's just saying, oh, no, I'm, I'm not one of them. I, he's, he's, he's disassociating himself with these followers. That happens in, in, in our own ways uh, today. Um, have you ever heard somebody say something like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not one of them. I, I don't, you, don't, you shouldn't associate me with them. And it's, it's true that there are maybe um, certain people who claim the name of Christ who will give Christians a bad name. And so, and so sometimes there's, there's something to that impulse. Uh, there's no doubt that Christians, just like non-Christians, can be difficult. And sometimes there are Christians who claim the name, or people who claim the name of Christ who aren't Christians at all. Right? So there's, there's some caveats there. But um, I think we see more and more that as, as uh, Christians are, again, whether, whether rightly or wrongly, as the world accuses Christians, that um, sometimes people will just cut and run altogether. And they'll say, oh, well, no, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of them. They're just a bunch of hypocrites, right? So, someone that still might, still might claim to... To, to, to be a follower of Jesus in some sense, but there's a disassociation with 
others who follow him. But to to disassociate yourself with the body of Christ is a a very dangerous thing. Um, Because, of course, Jesus is the head of the body of Christ. And so when we disassociate ourselves with the body of Christ, well, that can lead to a a disassociation with Christ himself. And, and oftentimes it's maybe exchanged for a more socially acceptable Jesus, right? So, so similarly, maybe you've heard people say something like, oh, well, that's not the Jesus I know. The Jesus I know is yada, yada, yada. And, and, and often this is an exchange of, of, a more, of a more socially acceptable Jesus. And so there's a disassociation with, with Jesus' followers, a disassociation with maybe even a biblical view of Jesus. And so again, this, this is a way in which we might be guilty of a similar thing. Again, Peter, he's in a very unique situation, right? He's, uh, he's, he's here um, uh, with, within, within, uh, um, within earshot of, of Jesus' uh, trial here in the court. And... Um, and so he, he has his own reasons but in his, in his own ways of denying Jesus. But uh, we, I think, can sometimes, uh, we see Christians following the same pattern. We see these stages of denial. And so um, we have the claiming ignorance. We have the diso- disassociation that might come in varying degrees. And then eventually what that uh, can lead to is an outright denial, which is what we see as we continue in verse 70. It says, After a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And so here, um, Peter kind of puts the final nail in the coffin, right? He, he started off subtle, saying, I don't know what you're talking about. And then he continued on to disassociate himself with those who were with Jesus. And then now in this third denial, he says straight up, he says, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Now notice it says at the beginning of verse 71, it says he invoked a curse upon himself. Now we should not understand this simply to mean that he said a curse word. Um, but what's going on here is, is actually more serious than that, considering the fact that he's lying. Right? Essentially, this is the equivalent of, of saying, I swear on my life, I swear on my life that I do not know this man. Um, in the Old Testament, we see some more explicit examples of this kind of oath, right? um, that is uh, invoking a curse upon oneself. And so the formula is kind of like this. Basically, it's let it be done to me, and more also if I am lying. That's probably something of what Peter said, right? When it says that Peter uh, invoked a curse upon himself. And so we see something like this in 1 Kings 19.2. We see it in Ruth 1.17. Again, essentially it's saying, let it be done to me, and more also if, if I am lying, right? Or again, maybe the modern equivalent would be, I swear on my own life. He invokes a curse. He swears. He says, I do not know this man. And so Peter not only lies here, but he seals it with an oath, bringing a curse upon himself. But worst of all is the content of this lie. Right? He says, I do not know this man. Now, most of us would probably never imagine saying those words. And again, you know, this is a unique circumstance that Peter is put in. But as, as we seek to see like how this might apply to us, um, well, I, I think we see the lesson that, hey, maybe we're not as immune as we think to doing something like this in, in, our, in our own way. You know, Peter was the rock, right? I mean, this, this, was, this was like Jesus' right-hand man, or at least one of, one of the three that was in his close circle. But we see that it, it started off with subtle denials, right? And so, again, uh, in our cultural situation today, it may be very, very easy uh, just, just to claim ignorance, just to 
uh, in, in a more subtle way, say, hey, yeah, I, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Um, and then from there, uh, to disassoci- disassociate yourself with the things that are uh, maybe considered socially unacceptable, right? that is the body of Christ itself, and, and then even to disassociate yourself with the biblical Jesus. And then finally, we see uh, a, a more obvious, straightforward denial. I do not know this man. Whether it ultimately leads to that or not, again, there's, there's a lesson here for all of us. It did lead to that for, for, for Peter, and it, it was at a fast rate. I mean, I mean, it all just happened just like that, one after another after another, even after he had been warned. Now, of course, we can maybe trace this back uh, a bit further, and, and we see, okay, well, yeah, remember, Jesus, remember Peter sleeping in the garden when Jesus told him to stay awake and to keep watch? Remember whenever Peter and the disciples fled, just like Jesus said, you know, the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. Or we could even go back further, I'm sure, and see, you know, I mean, Peter, Peter had his flaws, no doubt. And so we can examine, just like they did with Judas. Remember with Judas, we, we saw all these things that led up to his betrayal, right? So, so it, it, it starts off small, um, maybe in, in things in our lives that we don't keep a close watch on, um, but then... We see in this case with Peter that it really accelerated at an alarming rate. And so uh, we see a warning, right? A warning that no one is immune to falling, right? Peter, the rock, he fell hard. But of course, the big difference between him and Judas, as we've been making that comparison, is that by God's grace, Peter got up again. Peter got up again. And so, so that there, there's, there's some hope in the midst of this um, uh, really terrible scene. But it was a hard fall. Look at verse 72. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. He broke down and wept. What what a, a tragic scene we see here. And, you know, one thing I thought about as I was reading this, you know, the, the rooster crowing. Um, I don't hear rooster crows very often. Any, any of you hear a rooster crow? Uh, I mean, if you live on a farm, you have a rooster, then maybe you hear it often, right? But, but most of us aren't in that scenario where we ever hear a rooster crow at all. I think, uh, Wadey, I remember you were saying in Mexico, that was one of the things that you notice is always hearing the rooster crow, Right. And, uh, and I'm sure that in, in Peter's um, living situation that he often heard roosters crow. And I wonder if every, every time after that, as he heard a rooster crow, if it was a sobering reminder to him of this day. That would be indeed a sobering thing. But even so, Peter didn't let that define him. So again and again throughout the sermon, I've, I've, I've reminded you that the good news is, is that even though Peter fell so hard that he was able to get back up again. Um, you know, what, one of my favorite scenes in the Bible is in the Gospel of John where we see this. because we, we, don't, we don't see it here in Mark. Uh, but, but in John, right af- after Jesus' resurrection, remember he's appearing to the disciples on different occasions. And... Um, uh, the, uh, whenever he tells the disciples to cast the net on the other side and they bring in all these fish, very similar to whenever he first met them, right? It's almost kind of like a throwback to uh, whenever he first called them as disciples. Now the resurrected Jesus is standing on the shore. He tells them, they say, oh, it's the Lord. And, and remember, Peter jumps in and he swims to Jesus. Jesus had um, cooked breakfast for them there on the beach uh, on, on a charcoal fire. And, and, uh, and so they, they, they share this moment together. And then uh, Peter and Jesus kind of go off on a walk. And, and three times Jesus asked Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? He says, oh, yes, you know I love you, Lord. He says, well, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, yes, I love you. Feed my lambs. You know, and, and so he says kind of the same, the same thing, you know, different ways, three times. Three times he says, Peter, do you love me? And essentially he's giving Peter the opportunity to be restored, right? Peter had denied Jesus three times. And, so, and now Peter is 
able to affirm his love for Jesus three times. And so he's restored. And now, I mean, you know, Jesus has been raised from the dead. That makes all the difference. And so we see, um, again, as I, as I said at the beginning of the sermon, as, as we move along in Acts, we see Peter going forth with an unmatched boldness. A night and day difference between Peter cowering to a little slave girl, a little servant girl, versus him standing before councils and proclaiming the gospel without fear in the book of Acts. It's, it's an incredible, incredible change. And so, um, kind of in relation to this, we, we, we've, we've talked some this morning about the fear of man versus someone who has this kind of boldness in Christ. Someone who says, hey, if God is for us, who can be against us? What, what can man do to me? That's what we see becomes of Peter. And so, uh, again, we see, we, we, see, we see prime examples of, of both a fear of man and an unmatched boldness in Peter. So the question is, for all of us, is, is which, which will we follow? Right? We see some lessons as, as we look at these uh, three denials uh, of, of Peter. Again, we can analyze them and kind of think, okay, what's the nature of this denial and what are ways that we might deny Jesus, whether it's claiming ignorance or disassociation or an outright denial. Those are warnings for us, ways that we can examine ourselves to see. But, but what, what lies beneath the surface of all of it, I think, is that, that Peter had a fear of man. Right? The, reason, the reason he was denying Christ was because he, he, was, he was unsure of what would happen to him. Uh, he, he, he knew that uh, he was um, in a popular and perhaps unpopular and perhaps dangerous position. And so he cowered. He cowered in fear. And, 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 and it's a pathetic scene, isn't it? It's, it's a very sad scene. But then we see him emboldened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's the question. Um, which, which will we follow? You know, we, um, we all have uh, maybe fallen in one way or another uh, in varying degrees as, as we examine our own lives and, and, and whether or not we have stood with boldness for Christ. But even if you've fallen, even if you've fallen so far as Peter did, the good news is that you don't have to stay there. The good news is that you can be emboldened by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the challenge, right? That's the challenge for all of us. Um, the worship team is going to come up here in a minute, and, and we're going to sing uh, the, the song Rooftops. And, and in the chorus it says, So I shout out your name. From the rooftops I proclaim that I am yours. And so uh, my prayer is that we would all have that kind of boldness to claim the name of Christ, even in the face of persecution, even in the face of, um, uh, you know, maybe being misunderstood, that, uh, that we would not um, cower in fear, but that we would stand with boldness, that we'd be unashamed uh, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, worship team, you can go and come on up and then uh, I'll close this with a word of prayer. God, we, uh, again, thank you for uh, these examples that we are not to follow, but also we see in Peter an example that we are to follow um, by your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so I pray, Lord, that you would embolden us as believers and uh, help us to, uh, to not fear man, but to uh, live in service to you and... Um, for us to have that freedom in Christ. Um, help us all in our various ways to overcome the fear of man. Help us all to, um, conversely, to, to be emboldened by the gospel and uh, for us to have a reverent fear of you, Lord. And so we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.